and welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. If you haven't met me yet, my name is Heather and this is our 14th garden tour of the 2022 gardening season. Tell the people how unhappy you are. You're gonna be hearing a little sad voice in the background of today's video. That's because I just put Eidolon in the pen here with her boyfriend, Havoc. It's time for her to become bread so that we can get more milk out of her next year. She's less than impressed with the situation and she wants everybody to know, so now you know. Now back to the greenhouse where are the Heatmaster tomatoes. I don't know if they think they're getting a second wind or what, but they have some brand new blooms on them. And it's astounding to me that these plants are well over five months old and they're still putting on blooms. These are not indeterminate tomato plants. They are not supposed to really put these many flowers and blooms on as far as I knew, but here we are. So they put on all this new growth and all of these new blooms in the last week or so. And I mean, truth be told, I really thought that I would have been ripping out tomato plants from inside the greenhouse here right about now. And I am, but I expected to be doing so because the tomatoes were, you know, not gonna be producing anymore. So we are gonna pull out a couple tomatoes that are pretty sick because I do have some things to put in their place. So right here is an example of a sick plant that's really not worth nurturing any further. It does have some ripe fruit on it, but for the most part, its days are already numbered. So this is gonna be one of my first plants that I take out of the greenhouse. I have a Florida weave trellising system going on in the greenhouse here, and that essentially intertwines all of the tomato plants together. And so I can't just pull it out of the ground and haul it out of here. I kind of have to take it apart piece by piece and try not to knock any fruit off of the adjacent plants which is inevitably going to happen but it's absolutely okay lots of beautiful fruit still coming in i'm very very pleased impressed and honestly a little bit overwhelmed by this variety i genuinely didn't think it was going to be producing this much fruit at all all. So I'm very, very pleasantly surprised this is a good type of overwhelmed. But now I know exactly how many plants we're going to need next year. I really thought that this was going to be undercutting or underdoing what we were going to need to provide tomato products for our family. And I was very, very wrong. There is a lot of tomatoes coming in every single week. It has been slowing down as of late. It seems like, you know, the first flush of blooms that they put on, they really, really put them on. And subsequent bloomings have just been more of a trickle. But when you have this many plants, I think there's around 40 in the greenhouse. That trickle can still be a lot of tomatoes. In general, I like to leave the roots of the older plant in the ground whenever I remove anything from the garden. That allows the roots to break down and feed the soil microbiome underneath the soil surface and it adds nutrients to the soil as well. There's a little bit of a different situation here in the greenhouse versus our raised bed garden. Out there we have more of a square foot gardening method where we can kind of stagger plantings and leaving the stem or the roots in the ground isn't really a big deal because I can just plant a little bit offset and no harm done. Here where we have the holes cut or burned into the woven weed fabric, I don't really want to be cutting all kinds of holes in my fabric in order to be able to leave this in the ground. Right now this plant was pretty green on the bottom. It's pretty firm on the bottom. I don't think I'm going to be able to plant my next succession of what I have going in here right on top of this root ball. So I am going to have to dig it out. Oh, there it goes. There. Whew. So actually what I've got going in the greenhouse right now is a 
tromboncino squash. So I've seen these grown a lot on other gardening channels that I follow. This variety of squash seems to be pretty darn resistant to things like squash bugs and squash vine borers. And we have a heck of a time trying to grow any type of squash here because the bugs just do it in no matter how much work we put in trying to prevent them. So I'm doing a little bit of an experiment this summer and growing some of these out in the raised bed garden and here in the greenhouse. So honestly, my issues are really less so with the squash bugs. Those squash bugs kind of look like stink bugs and they're relatively easy to just find and pick off the plant. Our main issue with squash is the squash vine borer. And that actually is a worm that tunnels in through the vine of the squash and kills it right from the point where it tunnels straight on through the rest of the plant. And oftentimes they attack at the base of the plant so the entire squash is dead. And the moth, that lays that egg, lays one singular teeny tiny copper colored egg in general at the base of the plant and it's really hard to find, really hard to manage and you oftentimes don't know that the squash vine borer has attacked your plant until it's already in there doing damage. There is a product called BT and that product works really well because what it does is when the worm eats the part of the plant that has the BT on it, it actually makes them feel full and they stop eating. And if they stop eating, they eventually die and the damage to the plant can be pretty minimal. One of the issues with BT is that it can wash off in the rain and so you have to reapply it pretty often and sometimes when the plants get really really big it's hard to get into all those nooks and crannies. So my hope with the greenhouse and the overhead cover is that I can treat with BT to stave off the squash vine borer and really have minimal reapplications and hopefully really effective treatment this little plant is going into the planting hole without me re-amending directly. Now it is in a potting mix, which has a little bit of fertilizer in it. And I do plan to run fertilizer through my drip line here in about a month. So there's our little squash baby. And I put this one over here about a week ago and it's looking good. My plan for the tromboncino squash, which does oftentimes either need a lot of space to ramble or a trellis, is to go ahead and trellis the vine using tomato twine, a lot like I've done with those indeterminate tomatoes back there. So these guys just wind up this tomato twine and are attached at the purlins. So the hope is that I can take that squash there and run it up to the center purlin and maybe have another one going off to the side. So here's to hoping that that experiment works out. You can use a tromboncino squash as a summer squash and harvest it when the skin is nice and thin and the squash is nice and tender, or you can harvest it much, much later when the squash is a lot bigger, has a much harder rind on it and save it for several months over the winter and use it as a winter squash. So we may or may not be able to get the squash inside the greenhouse to a really mature phase like that. Our first frost date is towards the end of October and I don't know that there's enough time to take the squash out to that maturity but inside the greenhouse it is possible so we'll just have to see. We are starting to lose a little bit of light and I have some jalapenos to harvest. They're starting to turn red and I think they're gorgeous. So here they are. Our jalapeno plants have fallen over all but one. And oftentimes jalapenos are known to be green because a lot of times they are just green at the grocery store. But when you let them get a little bit older, they do mature into a red. And I think they're really pretty this way. So I think this is all I'm gonna harvest for now. We put away a lot of cowboy candy about a month ago, and that is a basically sugary type spicy preserve that a lot of people will put on things like hamburgers, hot dogs, scrambled eggs. I'm sure more cowboy candy is in our future, but I'm actually going to be fermenting these peppers and making hot sauce. Would you believe that this monstrosity here is essentially one plant. I've got kind of a dinky little plant that's in this green stock that really isn't contributing much, but this is a very massive spoon tomato. And it was a volunteer from when we actually had pigs in this greenhouse. Here's a ripe one. 
actually a few. Aren't they adorable? They're a very, very delicious flavor. I actually didn't plant any of those intentionally this year, partly because I knew that they were gonna volunteer somewhere. There's so many of these little tomatoes and they kind of fall off pretty readily when they're ripe that I just knew we'd see them again. Boy, am I glad for it. The flavor is really hard to explain. So they have a thinner skin like a lot of yellow tomatoes do. And it's not necessarily super sweet. It's got this lovely, acidic, umami, savory flavor. I've never had any other yellow tomato that tastes quite like it. I was gonna apologize for the state of my hands, but you know why they are the way that they are, so. Over here on this side is quite a jungle. Our Kajari melon that volunteered in here, it's this vine with the broad leaves in the back. That has done exceptionally well. It started to get a tiny bit of disease. Oh, oh man, what happened there? An explosion of sorts. Oh no, look at that. Yeah, but something ate it. Are those little teeth marks. So I had a melon hanging outside of the greenhouse just because of the way that they volunteered. Some of them are outside and it got stolen, but it looked like whatever critter took it got scared away from the melon before it got to finish. And they have little tiny, looks like sharp teeth poking down in there. It wouldn't surprise me if this was a raccoon, honestly. Oh, look, it looks like this one down here has some damage. Look at this, look at it. Oh man. So there's a couple options. We have seen raccoons. We have seen opossums here. I'm trying to think of other critters that really it might be. If you have any thoughts, we're in the Southwestern Kentucky area. I would love to hear them, but don't forget, we have this hog panel on the side of our greenhouse. So whatever it is, has to be getting through here, which that's actually a pretty big square. So honestly, it could be anything. I will say whatever it is seems to only have a taste for melons, at least right now, because I haven't noticed damage like this basically anywhere else. You know what we'll probably do? We'll set the trap tonight with a melon in the back because that's clearly what they want. I know Levi's gonna be down for that. Let's go get him. And there was a crisp flat one with nothing in it. <laughs> Highly suspicious, am I right? It's just weird. You wanna come set a trap for me? Yep. We can use that as bait, it's clearly what yep. they want. <laughs> groundhog. You think? Melon's the best bait for a groundhog, so. The things people find out, a melon is a good bait for a groundhog. Like you have to find this out through experience. <laughs> so it's gonna be coming in through here on this side. You see this, these yeah. trails? I'm officially losing light at this point. So we'll come back in the morning, check the trap, and then look at the raised bed garden. So just leave it. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it. It's supposed to get back up to 105 degrees today. So I'm gonna make sure that those little seedlings have water. But these ones we're gonna put in the ground in the raised bed garden. Over here, the cucumbers have kind of taken a hard hit. I have noticed that the miniature white cucumber can be a little bit susceptible to disease. And in all honesty, cucumbers really just don't do well in high heat. I could sow another succession of cucumbers to harvest some in the fall. I don't think I'm going to. I have a lot of pickles that we canned last year and I have done some fridge pickles this year. So whatever's dead, I'm gonna be yanking out and replacing with that opal basil. Some of these though, I did let get really, really ripe so that I can collect the seed from them. See, these cucumbers are normally small and white and they can get about twice this size. But then when you let them get really mature, mature enough to produce viable seed, they get almost round and orange. Look at this one. Because I think those 
cucumbers that I'm allowing to mature are not quite ready to pick for seed. I am gonna leave the cucumbers alone today, but these guys will probably be out by next week. We have a little treat this morning. Sweet potatoes are actually part of the morning glory family and they don't make as many flowers as some other morning glory varieties do, but that's fine. They're a nice little treat. That's actually the first one that I have seen this season. I'm not a morning person, so maybe I just haven't been out to see them. I'm sure they've been there. Look at how fat the stalk on this mammoth sunflower is. So it's planted in this probably two foot raised bed and it's way, way up there. I would guess that it's about six and a half or seven feet tall at this point and the bud isn't even ready to bloom yet. This one is a mammoth sunflower as well, starting to make a bud there. I have a couple of them kind of sprinkled throughout the garden, but none are as big as this one. A lot of our beans have kind of this weird shrivelly mosaic looking disease. I haven't seen much of this until this year and I'm really not sure what to think. Our little baby birds that were nesting in the green beans have actually disappeared. They were quite big when I discovered them instead of in their nest on the ground over here and eventually they made their way into the kids garden back here the kids were getting dive bombed for a couple days but now no sign of babies or mamas and we're hoping for the best for them they probably just got their wings and flew away so here's one of those tromboncino squash that i put out here i have already picked off squash bugs from this plant but i'm hoping we can get it trained up into this bare spot of trellis right there the other one is actually right here at the beginning of our arch and that should train right up here. I don't have any ripe Kajari melons to show you to have you compare to this interesting cross that we happened to grow. This is not a Kajari melon. It looks like one. This melon actually grew from seed that we saved a couple years ago. So this is what a normal unripe Kajari looks like. It has these really striking dark green coloring with this light green ribbing. And then this is actually from seed that I saved from a Kajari melon, but it looks like that melon crossed with something else because the difference in color is really not as striking. And the end coloration of the melon isn't quite as striking either. Like I said, I don't have a ripe Kajari melon to show you the difference, but I'll pop a picture up here so you can tell that there's really a big difference. The craziest difference though in these melons is when you cut them open. Normally these guys are green on the inside, kind of like a honeydew. These guys are actually orange on the inside. So based on prior knowledge of what I've planted in the garden before, I'm pretty sure that this melon is a cross between a Kajari and a Charente melon. And it has a really, really interesting flavor. It's less sweet than a Kajari. It's less fragrant than a Charente melon, but it has almost a savory flavor with this lingering aftertaste that actually is pretty tomatoey. It's really, really strange, but I kind of love it. Unfortunately, I won't be able to save the seed from this melon and expect the same result next year. This is what's known as an F1 hybrid and the genes on F1 hybrids are really unstable. I'm not even sure how to stabilize this gene, but it's okay if I don't. This is a once in a lifetime treat that we may never get to see again. All of the Kajari, even the ones that did come up normal, came out of the same seed packet from seed that I saved last year. I probably saved seeds from several different melons, or it's possible that the same melon had different pollens that pollinated the seed. Many times it takes more than one visit from a bee for the fruit to become fully pollinated, and 
probably not all of the seeds have the same genetics from the same melon. Blows my mind, it's really crazy. This little bed in the back of my garden has been sitting nearly empty pretty much all summer. So I've got some space here to fill and I have some herbs here that I've had a hard time getting to germinate. But I had a discovery the other day in the greenhouse that there are mice that like to tunnel in any kind of dirt that I keep on my seedling shelf over there. And the mice have been digging up and eating the seed out of the trays. It's been a little bit crazy. So I started these guys out here in the raised bed garden. This is dill. And honestly, dill really does flower quite readily in the heat. It is a cool loving herb, but a lot of my recipes for pickles actually require flowering dill heads. So I'm going to be planting some of these today. I love dill in soups and all kinds of other things. So I'm really looking forward to these taking off. Oh, side note, these are little cell trays from Burpee they very, very readily break down very, very quickly. I would not recommend buying these if you happen to see these in the store. They crumble and crack within one season. They're gonna be all over this bed. Over here I have opal basil. I ran out of green basil, but we really like to freeze and preserve pesto. It's an awesome grab and go sauce for over the winter or really any time. So I'm gonna be growing lots of basil, making lots of pesto because if I don't, I know I'm gonna regret it. You can see here that I have quite a few basil plants per pot. I'm not gonna be putting all of these in the ground. I'm probably going to be splitting them up and pinching some of them off. But what I did to sow these is I just scattered the seed that I had over top of the soil and kind of roughed up the top of the soil and watered them in. This was the result. These little cups though, these are from Bootstrap Farmer. These I highly, highly recommend. What if the world had more of your smile? What if the wind could spread your love? What if your sweetness could reach everyone? There'd be no wars. Mm -hmm. Maybe the birds will sing about your heart. Maybe the trees will whisper the word. Maybe the sun will spread your joy to the ones who lost their hope. I found here. That is a lettuce volunteer. So in this bed here previously I did have several heads of lettuce. I did let them flower and go to seed and I'm gonna let that grow. These are some of the little red opal basil seedlings that I did take out that I'm not going to plant. You can actually chop these up and eat them, put them in a salad. I'm gonna feed them to my chickens. I know this is not a chicken. I actually remembered on my way to the chickens that the bunnies also like a little herby treat every now and then. With rabbits, if they haven't had fresh greens very much like these rabbits haven't, you have to go slow. So this tiny amount is a really good treat for them. So I know I said that I was planting dill because I really like to have fresh dill in some of my pickling recipes, but I also said that I'm not really going to be growing any more cucumbers this year. Well, if you didn't already know, you can pickle pretty much any vegetable. Recently I pickled some peppers as well as a bunch of other processes, including cowboy candy that I mentioned earlier, and all of that is right up here in this video. So I'll go ahead and give it a click and I'll see you next time. Also, once we catch whatever has been rummaging through my greenhouse and eating my melons, I'm going to let you know, so stay tuned.